Order. Um, it's now time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And we will start with the listed questions. And could I, just before we begin, inform members that questions 6 and 15 have been withdrawn. I call Mr Stephen Mutri. Mr Mutri. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question 1. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. As members will be aware, the Executive set up the Delivering Social Change Framework to tackle poverty and social exclusion. It represents a new level of joint up working across government to drive through initiatives which can achieve real and long lasting social benefits for those in our society who need them most. The benefits of this approach are illustrated by the multi departmental multi-agency and multi-sectoral implementation of six key cross-cutting signature programs announced in October 2012 under a £26 million funding package. In addition, a further £1.6 million investment was announced in October 2013 to develop a future play and leisure signature program. These programs are focusing on early interventions, tackling the very root of issues before they have time to develop into problems. We are already starting to see positive outcomes through their practical delivery. Over 900 family members have already received support through an intervention to support young people not in education, employment or training. There have been 20 new nurture units in place, or are in place and are playing a key role in improving the lives and education attainment of our most vulnerable children. Over 225 teachers have been recruited to help children who are struggling with their English and maths and a suite of parenting support programmes have been developed and are providing additional high-quality parenting support. In addition, the family support hubs and the social enterprise hubs are due to be fully operational by the summer. We look forward to seeing further positive outcomes as the programmes continue to progress. And through the implementation of the Delivering Social Change Framework, we remain committed to tackling the integrated, complex and sometimes spiralling issues that can lead to social deprivation. For supplementary. Thank you. In thanking the junior minister for her response, can I ask her to outline the number of families that have benefited to date through the nurture unit in Upper Ban? I don't have exact um, numbers for the member of the Upper Ban constituency, but I can say that there has been over 140 um, young people uh, in terms of the, the nurture groups already have actually been assisted in the nurture groups. Um, myself and Junior Minister Bell actually visited um, some of the schools that, that were operating the, the nurture groups and I have to say that those uh, facilities that are there, the services that are there, are not only helping the children but also their wider families but they're also helping the, the teachers in the school uh, as well um, and I think that, that they very, very, have been very productive but I certainly get the, the numbers for your, the constituency that you asked for. Sir Alec Atwood. The, the junior minister uh, for her answer so far. Could I ask, um, in respect of the spread of uh, delivering social change projects, is there any funding gaps in relation to one or more than one of the proposals? And secondly, could you explain why it was that the monitoring committee, the monitoring report, June monitoring report was submitted to the committee, your committee, FMDFM committee, two hours before the committee met last Wednesday, necessitating both the chair and the vice chair discharge themselves from the responsibilities and for the meeting to be chaired by, a third, by another member of the committee. Why were we given a paper of such import two hours before a committee meeting began? Well, so to answer the member's uh, second question first, I know this has been an ongoing problem with a, a number of committees down through the years, even when I sat in the committees myself, of getting um, information like that, and I'd certainly look into it in terms of, of, uh, of the OFMDFM committee. Um, can I just say that, that in terms of the funding, um, to date there hasn't been any um, indication that there's been any uh, real problems in drawing down funding. The funding does come from a central uh, fund, uh, Delivering Social Change Fund, and it operates through the, the, the child care strategy, that we're, the Bright Start strategy. It also, in terms of the, um, the, the, other, the other parts of that, is the social investment fund. And there are, the, as I said, the central fund as well. But to date, I have had no um, indication that there has been any problems, no. Thank you. And I call Mr. Dahi Mackay. Question number two. Uh, the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister is committed to uh, 
uh, racial, ethnic and religious equality. We currently support the good relations work of the Belfast Islamic Centre through our Minority Ethnic Development Fund. We will soon launch a revised racial equality strategy entitled A Sense of Belonging. As part of the consultation process, we will run public events that will allow all people to contribute to this document, and I would encourage everyone to get involved in this process. This strategy must be fresh, informed, and focused on the needs of those individuals and families it represents. We can only do this if there is full participation from not just the minority ethnic se sector, but by everyone who wants to see all forms of prejudice and religious intolerance challenged and defeated. There is no doubt, Minister, that recent comments about the Muslim community have been hurtful to many uh, in our community primarily, but also undermines your own work in terms of trying to attract foreign direct uh, investment to your shores. Uh, uh, can I ask you, uh, could you tell us when the racial equality uh, strategy will be published? Because this will be vital uh, in helping ensure that such episodes uh, are made a thing of our past. Well, obviously I agree with the member that the events of the last uh, couple of weeks have been uh, shameful, and the comments of Pastor McConnell are uh, very unfortunate. Uh, he has apologised for those, and, and I think the very dramatic effect that those remarks had on the uh, Muslim community in Belfast were very evidenced by the conversations that we've had with the Muslim community at the Islamic Centre in South Belfast, where quite clearly people were placed into uh, an atmosphere of fear, to such a point where one young woman who is a teacher in some of the schools said she was afraid to go to her work. That is absolutely unacceptable. And I think the, uh, uh, the steps that have been taken in the course of the last uh, short while to uh, correct the situation were absolutely much needed. Uh, this, this will impact, if not handled correctly by ourselves, on uh, the prospects of us attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, this was a story that travelled all around the world and I think was very, very damaging. On the racial equality strategy that itself, it absolutely should be published and put out for consultation. I have cleared the draft and I'm optimistic it will be signed off in a few days. Uh, a racial equality strategy will set the framework for tackling racial inequalities and for promoting good race relations. Officials have been working with minority ethnic representatives through the racial equality panel to draft a strategy that will meet the needs and aspirations of minority ethnic people and of wider society. We want to make sure that the document is fit for purpose, and we will continue to work in partnership with representatives of minority ethnic people going forward with the consultation and the finalisation of the strategy to ensure that we achieve the same. I call Mr David Michael Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I do thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer so far. I'm sure that the Deputy First Minister would agree um, that whilst we should be standing against racism in all of its forms, um, would he agree with me, however, that in taking such a stand against racism, it is equally important not to demonise or stereotype an entire community? Well, I absolutely agree that all of us in positions of political leadership have got a duty and a responsibility to stand four square uh, beside each other but against racism and sectarianism within our society. I think the big difficulty about the last short while is that it gives a, a distorted picture of the overwhelming majority of our people from every section of the community who uh, want no hand act or part in uh, uh, racism or sectarianism. So this represents a, a real challenge for all of us, and I think it's a challenge that we have to rise to, and I want to pay tribute to all of those people over the course of the last couple of weeks who have come onto the streets to protest uh, against the uh, comments that were made, and to, I think, in doing so, uh, send a very clear message uh, here on the island of Ireland, in Belfast, and to the wider international community that uh, we are a society moving forward and that we're not prepared to capitulate 
to those within our society who would wish to uh, portray us as being in any way sectarian, racist or indeed bigoted? Well, Mr. Fergal McKinney. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Deputy First Minister, and can I concur with him about the shameful nature of the remarks uh, and acknowledge the fact that some words of apology uh, were used more recently. But can he acknowledge just how deep the damage has been and therefore how comprehensive the remedy must be, up to and including not just an apology to the Muslim community, but to the rest of society here? Well, I, I certainly hope that all sorts of lessons uh, will have been learned by the events of the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and I know that this isn't just about people in the Muslim community being offended. And I mean, these people we've met on a number of occasions over recent years, these are very civilized, very cordial, very intelligent, highly educated people who make a massive contribution to our society. These are professional people, many of whom have the lives of our people in their hands on a daily basis. And they are people in which I have absolute faith and trust. So I think that not just the Muslim community were offended by this. I think wider society as a whole was also offended by this uh, uh, situation. And I think the focus now has to be how we move forward, how we learn the lessons from the last couple of weeks. And remember, this is all happening against the backdrop. What are clearly being reported by the PSNI as increased attacks on ethnic minorities, uh, particularly in the Belfast area, uh, much of which has been instigated by uh, elements within the UVF. That has been very, very clear for some considerable time, and I've been on the public record in this House uh, stating that. And that places, I think, a huge onus on all of us to stand together against these attacks, but be very focused on what we need to do in the future, and I think the publication of the racial equality strategy, which is long overdue, uh, needs to uh, urgently address the issues that lie at the heart of this matter. There is a later question on the, uh, the anti-racism strategy. I call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And taking the Deputy First Minister's comments into consideration, what financial or material support Will his department offer to the Muslim community to ensure that they have a cultural centre that actually meets their needs? Well, this was an issue which came very much to the fore during the course of both the First Minister and my own visit to the Islamic Centre. And that uh, we have absolutely accepted that the Muslim community are entitled uh, to a mosque uh, if, if a proper site can be found which is suitable uh, for themselves. And the First Minister is actually on the public record as saying that uh, he believes that it would be appropriate, and I agree with him, uh, that uh, if, if necessary, public funds could be used to uh, provide uh, assistance in regard to uh, the construction of a mosque uh, in Belfast. So, yes, I think that there is a huge responsibility on all of us now to ensure that we deal with the needs and the concerns of the Muslim community. Hopefully, the racial equality strategy, when it goes out for consultation, uh, will be uh, contributed to in a very meaningful way. And once that is put into effect, that coupled with a very strenuous efforts to provide a mosque, uh, I think should send a very powerful message to our own people, but also to the international community, that we are a very tolerant society, which recognises that diversity actually enriches our society. I call Mrs. Sandra Lowe. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister uh, uh, what specific provisions relating to Islamophobia are going to be included in the new strategy? Well, I, I think that hopefully within the next uh, number of days the, the member will see the detail of uh, what has been put out for consultation. Uh, we, we obviously, because of the events of the last couple of weeks, uh, are focused on the needs of the Muslim community and those people at the Islamic Centre in South Belfast, but it's a wider issue than that. It's about our general attitude to people who come from uh, far distant shores to come and live among us. I am one of those people who absolutely believes that diversity is a good thing, that it's actually a strength, that we have our society enriched 
by the presence of people who come from different cultures. We live in a world which is increasingly cosmopolitan, and I think that there is a huge responsibility on all of us to ensure that the rights of people uh, and the equality associated with that is implemented in a way that ensures every section of our society, including the Muslim community, feel, uh, feel part of our society and feel wanted. I think the experiences of people in this island over many centuries, where people went off to far-flung regions of the world, whether it be North America, Australia or wherever, and where many of them were very badly received at a time of, I think, great ignorance, uh, you know, many centuries ago. The fact that this, this is now happening in our day and that there are still a very tiny minority of people within our society who have uh, racist attitudes, have sectarian attitudes, well, they need to get a very clear message that there is no place in our society for any of that sort of activity. And the member herself has been the subject of uh, these criticisms and attacks, and I absolutely deplore her treatment and the treatment of all of those who have come to live among us and who make a massive contribution to our society. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Cast number three. Question three, please. Uh, with your permission, Principal Deputy Speaker, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. The Executive's Disability Strategy aims to set out a high-level policy framework to give coherence and guidance to departments' activities across general and disability-specific areas of policy. It provides a framework for the implementation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. The strategy emphasises the fact that young people with disabilities should be supported in addressing transition needs so that they have the same opportunities for growth and fulfilment as non-disabled young people. The strategy refers to Article 24 of the United Nations Convention relating to education, which includes access to an inclusive education system at all levels and lifelong learning. Employment and employability are issues which require government departments to work together to support people with disabilities. The Executive's Disability Strategy aims to set out actions to promote education, vocational training and employment opportunities, as well as safeguarding the employment opportunities of those who are, are already in work. It aims to increase the opportunities for people with disabilities to attain skills and qualifications through access to appropriate training and lifelong learning opportunities. In taking forward the delivery of the strategy, all departments have committed to consider what needs to be done and how they will measure progress. One key aspect of the Department for Employment and Learning's contribution to the disability strategy will be to chair a cross-departmental focus group on transitions for young people with severe learning difficulties and disabilities. Mr. Sean Lynch for a supplement. I'm going to break his lesson in our and Fragrishin and to thank the Minister for our answer. Does the Minister believe that enough has been done at community level to help people with disabilities? Well, I think the member would agree, and I'm sure other members will agree, that, that this is an issue that concern, you know, we have heard concerns of, of people with disabilities and indeed their families. And I know that, that that ministerial group, that there is a transitions paper that has been um, brought forward to that group, and we will be looking at that, that very issue. Um, uh, in terms of uh, particularly young people when they leave um, the school or whatever they're at, uh, at 19, you know, they can sometimes be um, you know, uh, very vulnerable to you know, the lack of support that they have enjoyed when they've been in the school setting. And I think that there, are, there is a, a team that works with the parents and a team that works with the young person to find those work placements. And it doesn't have to be just work placements, it could be volunteering or mentoring or whatever. So I think that, that there is a need to ensure that when we do, uh, we do have the, 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 that transition for the young person at 19, that we have those community-based projects, because there are some with very complex needs as well that actually might need to have a daycare setting as well. So I think it's very, very important. Well, well, Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you. And uh, could I ask the junior minister, and um, thank her for her answer so far, but could I ask the junior minister to give this house some further information on the 12 cross cutting themes and the 18 um, strategic priorities associated with the disability strategy? Uh, well, um, they, as you know, the disability strategy um, has been. Um, has, uh, was out for, for consultation from last, last year, I think it was 
I can't remember the month, but it was 2013. And I think that, that in terms of theme seven, for instance, the transitions from childhood to adulthood, um, you have theme 10, which is employment and employability. So you have a, a number of themes there that, that's actually directly connected with the, the transitional period. But you've also a number of other themes that looks at, for instance, um, disability awareness, um, advocacy for disability, people with disabilities and organisations. You have monitoring and reporting as part of the strategy. You have employment and the standard of living. And you have tackling crime for people with disabilities. And also access, just, uh, and that access wouldn't just be for transport or access to buildings. That access is also, also sport and leisure. So you have uh, very clear uh, uh, themes there that actually uh, entail a cross-departmental approach and the uh, departments working together to ensure that they are delivered in that way. Call Mr. John uh, Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer. And as a, a former teacher, would she agree with me that the provision for those children who have reached 19 is appalling by any standard and certainly does not uh, register the type of equality that was enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement, and would you further agree that it is time for this Assembly to stop sitting on its hands and actually do something? Well, I, mean, I, I said earlier in my earlier answer, um, I, as a, a, as a representing people, I have had um, constituents come into my office to say you know, the, the lack of support and the lack of you know, um, particularly community-based activity um, uh, that the, the people um, you know, they, they do face those problems when they, they reach 19. I would hope that with that ministerial group now in place and that paper coming you know, to, to that, uh, um, that, that, that group, you know, it's not going to solve everything, but certainly it's been looked at, and I know that that's a big issue that has been raised at that level as well. So. And I call Mr. Cahillo Hoshin. Well, the economic pact contains measures that will promote and accelerate economic growth as we build a shared and prosperous future. We are making good progress with the packets in areas such as job promotion, assisted area status, identifying further shared future projects, progressing our red tape review, promoting research and development and broadband, further developmental work on corporation tax, considering further fiscal devolution and setting up a joint ministerial task force to address banking. It is straightforward to measure how well we are doing with economic pact actions and we are due to meet with the British Prime Minister later this month to discuss this. The Northern Ireland Council for Voluntary Action, Commentary and Economic Data makes no reference to any difficulties concerning the measurement of the impact of the economic pact. Uh, the NICFA report does put forward some recommendations, giving its views on ways to improve how we measure our total output, investment to exports, public expenditure and regional data. The recommendations which are of most relevance to the economic pact are those which relate to enhancing the accuracy of public expenditure data and strengthening measures of economic growth. Does the Minister believe that there is potential for improvement in local economic data? Well, there are some challenges associated with securing the level of information to facilitate a deeper understanding of all the dynamics of the local economy. Uh, we would benefit from the publication of input output tables which are currently in development. There are significant gaps regarding local public finance data which exist because the uh, Treasury in London do not publish disaggregated receipts. The accuracy of the estimates of locally generated uh, revenue could be improved. Ultimately, it would be in our best interest to have a full set of accurate public sector accounts and the British Government should support us to achieve this. Addressing these gaps would enhance local economic strategies as we would have greater information regarding local economic uh, performance. I call Mr George Robinson. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, as we are now approaching the anniversary of the economic pact, could the Deputy First Minister indicate what progress has been made on it in the last year and if any formal announcement is likely? Well, I think considerable progress uh, has been made 
uh, in relation to the commitments made in the economic pact. Progress made against these actions is establishing the foundations for future economic growth. And while we welcome this progress, it is important that we continue to work with the government to take action to ensure that all commitments are delivered uh, in a timely manner. Securing the powers to lower corporation tax remains a key priority for the executive to promote the growth of the private sector. We will continue to advance the case for devolution of corporation tax within the time frame set out in the pact. Considerable progress has also been made against the key pact commitments in relation to the review of business red tape. Considerable progress has been made in all four work strands of the review. Uh, and uh, I'm encouraged by the positive engagement with business representative bodies, regulators and departments. It's essential that uh, businesses provide evidence to support emerging uh, recommendations. Uh, the pilot enterprise zone in Coleraine announced in the budget statement on the 19th of March will only offer enhanced capital allowances as an incentive, potential to promote economic development and further investment in the area. Access to local finance welcomed the extension of start-up loan schemes here, 99 loans drawn down to date with a total value of 459,000, uh, and welcome confirmation that we will continue to benefit from a 100% assisted area status, at least in the medium term. Thank you. And I call Mr Kieran McCarthy. Question number five, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. Well, um, can I just say that, that the Deputy First Minister has already outlined in his earlier answer um, the, the sort of the, we would be hopeful that it would be an, only a matter of days. Um, I hope uh, there will be a number of events will be held in the areas of highest population for min minority ethnic people, and events will be facilitated in different languages when relevant. Um, so um, we are hopeful that, that it will be very soon. Mr. McCarthy, for so, thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Given the hugely detrimental publicity around the world from Northern Ireland as a result of the disgraceful uh, diatribe and venom coming from the Belfast pub, pub, pulpit recently, the Office of First and Deputy First Minister must be hugely embarrassed and indeed ashamed that in seven years. Um, strategy to tackle the racial equality has not been produ produced. Will the Deputy First Minister tell this Assembly what specific issues has held this strategy up for seven years? And if and when it comes, will there be sufficient resources to see it implemented uh, without further delay? Well, can I just say yes, uh, um, I agree with the member. It is unacceptable that it's taken so long and there have been issues that needed political agreement on those issues, but they have hopefully been resolved and we want to see that strategy published as soon as possible. Can I just say that in terms of resourcing the strategy, yes, um, we believe that the, the strategy will be adequately resourced and we also um, will we'll, uh, have, have set out in the strategy a number of points that, that we're, we're specifically looking at in terms of, of taking it forward. Um, one is the um, elimination of racial inequality, um, combating racism and hate crime, the equality of service provision, participation, social co cohesion and capacity building for groups as well. And can I also say to the member that there will be alongside that strategy um, a separate uh, fund, that the 1.1 million from the Ethnic Minority Fund, which development fund, which will also um, hopefully um, go in some way. But I totally agree with you in terms of the, um, the, the, the length of time that, that is totally unacceptable. And I call uh, Bronwyn McGahan. Uh, Minister, we understand the importance of the publication of the racial equality strategy, but can you tell us what is OFM, DFM doing to address the increase in racial attacks? Well, I mean, uh, as I said last week when I was speaking in the Assembly on the debate on the racist attacks, are, um, that, that really um, the, the strategy will, will in some part um, help, certainly, but there's also much more needed to be done. And I think that, that, that one of the best things that we can do, um, again, as the, the Deputy First Minister outlined earlier in his questions, is basically to stand together to show our support 
for those people that feel vulnerable out there, those people that feel under threat out there. And I think that that, that is right across society, political leaders, church leaders, um, community leaders. And there, has, there is a number of... Um, there is a number of initiatives that we're also going to be taking in the short term as well for to look at actually putting a leaflet campaign out, for instance, to try and send that visual message out to our ethnic minority um, people, but also in terms of to try to uh, develop an, uh, an alti, an, uh, a multi-agency approach like there is, for instance, in the South Belfast area, um, uh, the Round Table. Um, we're also going to try and put that in place in East Belfast, in North Belfast and in West Belfast. So the, there are proposals on the Unite Against Hate Crime, uh, or the Unite Against Hate Initiative also. We're going to take that forward again. So there's a number of interventions that we're all we're doing as well as putting the strategy out. There's some of them short term um, uh, immediately, there's some of them medium, uh, and then there's other ones that's going to be more long term. So I think that, that really, but at the minute I think the important thing is to show Show that support and solidarity to people out there. Thank you, and that ends the period for listed questions. And we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mrs. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. The Deputy First Minister will be aware of the restriction on non-Catholic teachers being able to teach within the maintained schools without a certificate for religious education. Can the Deputy First Minister assure this House that he will support the abolition of this discriminatory practice and take steps within OFM-DFM to have it removed? Well, uh, th this is something, obviously, which uh, lies within the remit of both the Department of Education and the Office of First and Deputy First Minister. And it has been the subject of some considerable debate over the course of many years. I, I think there, there obviously is a huge responsibility on all of the stakeholders in relation to this matter to see if a satisfactory outcome, which all sides can live with, uh, can be uh, achieved. And I would certainly encourage everybody to be involved in a very uh, constructive debate around how to resolve that matter. And the hail for supplement. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer, but in his drive to deliver equality, will he outline, given his public statement both outside this House and inside this House, regarding respect for other communities, how does the non-Catholic access the Certificate of Religious Education? Well, that's, that's the challenge, and obviously what we're dealing with is the historic nature of education here in the north of Ireland, going back many decades since uh, the partition of Ireland in the early 1920s. And the Catholic education sector uh, obviously uh, took up the mantle in relation to the education of Catholic children, and as a result of that, practices were put in place, which now, in the context of uh, a society moving forward and evolving, uh, I think necessitates everybody to approach the issue in a way that uh, doesn't allow anybody be, to be open to the accusation of discrimination of any kind. Mr. Alistair Ross is not in this place, so we move on and call Ms. Sandra Overan. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And as we come to the close uh, of another school year, uh, when our children, depending on the weather, obviously might spend a higher than average amount of time on the internet, could the Minister provide an update on their responsibility of a cross-departmental internet safety strategy. Uh, with your permission, Principal Deputy Speaker, Junior Minister McKeon will take this. Yes. Well, the member will be aware. I mean, we've had a, a number of meetings in relation to this, um, and you know, it, it is getting taken forward. We met with the Safeguarding Board, um, and we've also met with the Children's, uh, the National Children's Bureau, um, in recent weeks. Um, in terms of the, the progress that has been made in taking the strategy forward. The forum has already met the, the forum that was getting set up, and myself and Junior Minister Bell, when we were in Brussels um, last week, um, uh, we joined COFASI, um, who is an international organisation over there, um, to actually put a, 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 it was a video stream uh, to have a conference, but it was video streamed out or around a number of countries. But certainly, we have made some uh, uh, progress in terms of actually, you know, connecting internationally as well in terms of, of the uh, uh, the whole internet safety, the digital safety for our children and young people. And I certainly look forward to meeting with the member again to update her on the work that has been taken forward in that respect. 
So we're in for a supplement. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that information. I am a, a she mentioned about the eSafety Forum had had their first meeting. Um, I wonder, could the Minister uh, nail down a time frame uh, for the work of that eSafety Forum to be completed and such a strategy to be, to be brought to the Assembly? And could she tell us what resources will be provided to them? Again, I, mean, I can only say to the member, I mean, it's something that, that I personally take um, a, a, a keen interest in to drive forward because I have three teenagers myself, and I know, you know as a parent, you know, that, that even parents you know, are out there looking to see what they can do and how they can help. And certainly um, we, we, we are um, trying to get it pushed forward as quickly as possible. Um, and can I also say that, that you know, in terms of, of the, the work that has been carried out and, and, and the connections that we've made when we were over in, in Brussels, you know, we certainly hope that that eSafety Forum are now in a position that they will be um, you know, uh, driving the, the, the the strategy, sorry. Obviously, the member would know it's the Department of Health's main responsibility, but certainly as junior ministers, we're very, very keen to ensure that that actually is um, brought forward as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I call Principal Deputy Speaker, the Deputy First Minister will be aware that the Victims Commissioner has said that revelations about secret deals are eroding the trust and confidence of people bereaved and injured during the Troubles. Given that comment, and given his role as the Deputy First Minister, of which the Victims Commission comes under his remit, uh, will he not ensure uh, that his colleagues, indeed himself, does take part in the uh, inquiry uh, by the Select Affairs Committee, and that they give evidence to that in a public and open, transparent fashion, rather than continuing to go on the run on this particular issue? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the member needs to be very conscious that when I stand here as Deputy First Minister, I stand here. Uh, representing uh, a joint department and uh, I don't stand here as uh, someone who has a duty and a responsibility to speak for Sinn Féin. I speak for the Office of First and Deputy First Minister. But I will say that the, uh, the, the question is a valid question uh, insofar as uh, it does deserve an answer from my perspective. And I make the point that I'm not speaking on behalf of the First Minister in relation to this. But the reality is that myself and Jerry Adams and uh, Jerry Kelly met with uh, Lord uh, Justice Hallett uh, just a few days ago. She was given the responsibility to take forward uh, an inquiry into uh, this matter. First thing to be said is that, uh, and I know there's a dispute between us on the matter, uh, this is not absolutely nothing to do with a secret agreement. All of this was in the public domain going as far back as Weston Park and every single member of this House knows that. The reality is that then a decision was taken by the committee to establish its own investigation. And ju just to, if you like, flag up the difficulties that this presents, uh, some unionist uh, politicians have said to me in the course of the recent while that uh, this body will not report until probably early in the new year, and it has been flagged up that the Ulster Unionist Party in particular isn't prepared to engage in a way forward in dealing with the past until such times as that committee comes in with its report. So they're not satisfied with any outcome from Lord Justice Hallett. So this has huge implications for whether or not we as a body are going to deal with how we Learn from the past, the how we learn from the past and how we deal with the other issues associated with it. So given, for supplement. Well, given the role that the Deputy First Minister has uh, over the Victims Commission and given uh, that victims are looking to that office for truth, for honesty and indeed at times for justice, does the Deputy First Minister want to apologise for his crass comment when he said, how sorry do you want me to be for the specific uh, acts that his provisional IRA was involved in whenever he was a commander of the IRA, will he apologise for that comment and step up and tell the truth about what he and his hate-filled provisional IRA was involved in during the 30 years of conflict? Well, I, th I think the member needs to be very, very conscious that uh, in the course of a conflict that lasted for a quarter of a century, uh, there were many people involved in violence including many people supported by the member 
and uh, all of the unionist parties in this assembly. Uh, and I think that, you know, I, I would like to think that the work that I've been involved in over the course of the last 20 years, uh, which I don't think even compares, I don't think even compares with the contribution that the member, and indeed many members on the opposite ben benches have made towards peace, that that work, 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 as the uh, old Native American Indian chief said, you know, fine words, as some people expect here, mean little unless it amounts to something. I think the work I've been involved in over 20 years has amounted to something, and I've done that in the face of much opposition, including from some members on the opposite benches. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, given the fact that in my own constituency of North Antrim, and in particular Bellamina last night, many families and households were subjected to flash flooding, what can the Minister do to ensure that his office aids and abets a coordinated approach to save those householders from being flooded once again, some of which have been flooded now five times in the last six years? Well, I, I'm, I'm in total sympathy with the uh, issue that the member uh, raises. I, I think there is a huge responsibility on all of us in a very coordinated way to uh, seek remedies to these uh, situations. And I think that if you look at the events of the last couple of years, it, it is quite obvious that all of the departments are working in a very coordinated way. Obviously, the department in the lead in regard to this at the moment is the Department of Regional Development. But I think we all have a responsibility to work together to ensure that the terrible circumstances that people have faced in the Balamina area are addressed as quickly as possible. For a supplement. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank the Minister for his question. Given the fact that uh, whilst we commend the people on the ground for their efforts, it took road service an hour and a half to bring sandbags and it took the fire service uh, two hours to bring an appliance to pump water. What more can the Office of First Minister, Deputy First Minister, do to make sure that any coordinated approach is hastily put in place in order that the damage is, uh, is uh, not as bad as what it, what it is and is, is able to save houses before they are actually flooded? Well, I, th I think the member can, can be reassured that we in the Office of First and Deputy First Minister take these uh, situations very seriously indeed. These cause, uh, I think, terrible trauma for those people who have had their households in particular uh, flooded, their businesses flooded. And I think that the uh, way in which we have uh, established uh, work and processes in a very coordinated way among departments has put us in a position where we can deal effectively with uh, quite a number of unexpected situations which occur. And if you look at the weather over the course of the last couple of days, I mean, we've gone from bright sunshine one minute to uh, in incredible deluges the next. And I suppose in circumstances like that, it, it is very difficult for infrastructure to cope with that sort of a situation. And I suppose in all of these matters also, the reality is that no two situations are the same. So all the time, lessons are being learned. And I think that the Department of Regional Development, the Department of the Environment, supported by OFM, DFM, and indeed other departments, including the Department of Agriculture and uh, Rural Development, uh, you know, it is incumbent upon all of us to ensure that we are well prepared to deal with these fairly extraordinary uh, weather outbreaks that we've seen in the course of recent times. Can I call Mr. Jim Allister? Turn to the question that the Deputy First Minister doesn't want to answer. As a victim maker, why did he go out of his way last week to insult and demean the innocent victims of the IRA by arrogantly asking, How sorry do you want me to be? Last week, the Deputy First Minister was very keen that his partner, the First Minister, should do a lot of apologising. Would he now like to take the second opportunity today to apologise? for his condescending outburst? Well, it's, it's obvious that the member is uh, selectively extracting uh, one aspect of an interview that I gave to Stephen Nolan. Uh, it would be, be much better representing 
the totality of what I said in relation to that matter. And I think in the context of the remarks that I made, I clearly outlined my view that an awful lot of people, including Republicans, had a lot to be sorry for uh, over the events of the last uh, 25 years. And I would include in that uh, the people that he supported uh, in the state forces who were up to their necks in violence for much of the quarter of a century. And, uh, time is up.